Good morning, everyone. My name is Keith Barfield, and I'm a founding member with BMSS Advisors and CPAs. BMSS was established in 1991 and has grown to become Alabama's second largest accounting and advisory firm. With an innovative and service-oriented mindset, our ultimate mission is to provide peace of mind to our clients. We have five locations throughout the state and specialize in several industries, including manufacturing, distribution, construction, technology, nonprofits, and government contracting, to name a few. We are an independent member of the BDO Alliance USA, a nationwide association of independent owned local and regional accounting, consulting, and service firms with similar client service goals. For more information, please visit www.bmss.com. We would like to thank you for taking time to join us this morning for our webinar, BMSS Presents a Cybersecurity Update. Before we get started, there's a couple of housekeeping uh, items to mention. If you have any questions, you can use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. There will also be polling questions. So if you would like to receive continuing professional education credit, please answer those as they pop up. You know, uh, you wouldn't be on this call unless you were at least a little bit concerned about cybersecurity. So let's make the most of our time together uh, by learning about what is happening right now from a panel of experts. To begin, uh, let me introduce our panelists. We are very fortunate to have Brian Jackson, Jeff Schaefer, and Jack Pruitt with us this morning. Jack Pruitt is a commercial risk consultant with the Pruitt Group here in Birmingham. He has been with the Pruitt Group for five years after graduating from Auburn University and follows the path of his grandfather, father, and uncle in continuing the legacy and tradition that distinguishes the Pruitt Group. The Pruitt Group is a full service insurance agency serving the Birmingham area since 1974. Jeff Schaefer is the president of engineering management in Stroh's Freeburg, Dallas office. He provides breach or compromise response services and proactive cybersecurity assessments um, for numerous industries, as well as law firms, federal and state uh, and local entities. He supports clients in developing proactive or preventative programs such as incident response plans and also directs and manages litigation support related to digital forensic investigations and handling electronic discovery matters. Jeff is a 25 year veteran of law and federal law enforcement and retired from the US Secret Service in 2015. Brian Jackson is the president and chief operating officer of Abacus Technologies in his role, he oversees all executive decisions and, operate, and operations of the company, along with providing client solutions and development. He began his career in technology by implementing accounting systems, business intelligence solutions, and developing system integrations, and now uses that experience to help clients implement, support business applications, computer hardware, network infrastructure, cloud solutions, and, so, and cybersecurity processes. This webinar will be more of a panel discussion, but first, we'll let the panelists say a few words about their company and what they do. Then we'll be, begin with questions. Uh, please remember to use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit questions. So um, let's advance the slide and we'll let Jack Pruitt go first on uh, a little story about himself. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Keith. Good morning, everybody. Thank you all for, for being on. Uh, I want to thank BMSS and Keith for having me on as a panelist. Uh, they've been a big partner to us here at the Pruitt Group for a long time. And 
We really appreciate it. Uh, you can go to the next slide. I want to give a little bit of background on the Peru group. Um, you can go to the next slide. That really has most of the information. Um, we are a local and family owned commercial insurance agency here in Birmingham. We were founded in 1974 and service a little bit more than 4,000 clients and represent over two dozen of the top rated insurance carriers in the country. You can go to the next slide. Next, I wanted to, to just give a brief overview on cybercrime in general. Um, this slide really represents how it's, it's increasing almost every single year. Um, and in recent years, it's ramped up to extreme rates. Um, you can see the jump there on the chart from 2019 to 20 is by far and away the biggest year over year jump in cybercrime um, in the past 10 years. Um, in 2020 alone, the FBI estimated that more than $4 billion was lost to cybercrime as just in the U.S. Um, it's a 300% increase in the number of cybercrimes reported in the U.S. from 2010 to 2020. And just in the last two years, there's been a 152% increase in global data breaches to small businesses specifically. You can go to the next slide. Um, and I also want to talk about why it's increasing. Um, and frankly, it's because it's extremely lucrative for cyber criminals, A, and B, it's, it's extremely difficult to get caught. Um, only around 0.3% of all reported cybercrime complaints end with the criminal being prosecuted, and only one in seven cybercrimes are actually reported. So a very, very small amount of people who are committing these crimes are, are being put in jail. Um, part of that is because it's difficult to prosecute um, from a jurisdiction standpoint. A lot of these crimes are happening on the other side of the world that it's just, it's almost impossible to get to these criminals. Um, and they can make an average of $140,000 per ransomware attack. I think that number may be even a little bit low. I think every day that number probably ticks up as they, they increase you know, just how good they are at this. Um, that's it for myself and the Peru group and a little overview. And next we have Jeff. Good morning, everyone. And again, thank you for the opportunity of being here. Hopefully, you uh, can add some value to it and, and you can learn and, and, and hopefully take some things away that you can uh, increase your cyber maturity and, and try to get uh, your your hands around the all, every evolving threat actors and, and what they're doing. The stats are great. Just a couple more I, I wanted to add to that. One was that uh, everyone talks ransomware, ransomware was actually business email compromises was what uh, provide the greatest losses. So these are when people come into your system and get you to wire funds somewhere where they shouldn't, those types of uh, fraud uh, events and a business email compromise. Uh, and also, as Jack said, uh, the small, medium-sized companies are getting targeted a lot more. Uh, one more thing on trends is um, their demands are going down as far as amounts in ransomware. They're no longer starting with 20 million and negotiating for three or four weeks down to whatever the amount might be. They're starting with a much lower amount which is good, but the bad thing is they're only giving you 48 to 72 hours to make a decision. And then they'll take their action of posting your data on their shame sites or, or, or doing something more nefarious than what they've already done. Uh, so there's a lot of trends that you need to stay ahead of from a threat intelligence standpoint. Um, for me, I, I did come from Secret Service, did 25 years there. I retired as a digital forensics lab manager for a multi-agency task force. We did uh, a lot of response, um, but and a lot of forensics, everything from you know, vehicle forensics, uh, to you know, computers, phones, uh, GPS devices, you name it, about 12 guys in the lab and another 12 or so outside the lab that worked in their own agencies. Been in the private sector now for about eight years. Uh, spent about 80% of my time in breach response, helping companies get through an incident, and about 20% of my time in the proactive space, which I actually prefer, obviously, coming from Secret Service. It's kind of in my DNA to prevent something from happening. Um, and while reaction is great, uh, and I was on a React Force with service as well, the proactive is uh, is very important to me and, and helping people get it to be as strong as they can from a maturity standpoint. All right, Brian, you want to go? Uh, yeah, thanks, Keith. Um, I'm Brian Jackson, Advocacy Technologies. Uh, Advocacy is part of the, the BMSS uh, family of companies. And, you know, our primary objective is to help solve uh, technology problems, uh, you know, for small to medium size and even some enterprise. Uh, businesses. Uh, we have a dedicated security team to try to uh, prevent and, and help clients work through and respond to uh, the threats that both Jeff and, and Jack mentioned. 
Uh, so we often uh, deal with and, and help clients uh, mitigate the risk associated uh, with business email compromise ransomware. Uh, we too like to be more on the preventative side. So you know we want to see clients with secure backups. We want to have make sure they have security awareness training in place and really good email security uh, since it continues to be the most active threat vector that we see. Um, one of our specialties, of the course, is cybersecurity risk assessments, and we always recommend uh, that's where you start your journey with cybersecurity. Uh, very passionate about cybersecurity. I really believe uh, not only today's information will benefit you from a, a business perspective, but also a personal perspective. So it is uh, us versus the adversary. So looking forward to this session today. Thank you. All right. Well, let's get on down to the questions. And uh, I'll lead off, and, and Jack, I'll direct this to you first, and then we'll go around the panel. It seems the need for cybersecurity in any organization, regardless of size, has significantly evolved over the past 20 years. What changes have taken place, and how should organizations handle the growing need for cybersecurity? So go, Jack. Thanks, Keith. It definitely has evolved significantly over the last 20 years. Um, I would say that it, it, cybercrime sort of started out as the criminals would hack into your system and they would steal your information to then sell it on, on the black market. And while that still happens, it's not as common today. Um, after that, they kind of moved towards hacking your system and just stealing money directly um, from you or you know the bank. And But banks got too good at that and they kind of shut that down. Now what they've moved more towards is deception and ransomware. We'll get a little bit more into the, the weeds on that. Um, a lot of it starts in your inbox, as Jeff had mentioned. Um, I would say, you know, how it should handle the growing need is, is a lot of companies now offer a, what's called add-on insurance uh, for their cyber policies. And, and it's just not adequate. So if you if you have a bot policy, for instance, from an insurance standpoint, you can just add on and it'll give you roughly you know fifty thousand dollars limit for cyber. And and those policies have a lot of holes in them. The limits are not adequate. Um, and I would say that that you know maybe 10, 15 years ago you could have gotten away with that, but they are they are no longer um, adequate for for today. Okay, let's go over to Jeff. Sure. Um, yeah, I think there's been a lot of changes. I mean, I think one of the biggest issues is people will treat cybersecurity as building a fence. Uh, it's not a fence. It's that malleable bubble. You have to be able to adjust to what the threats are. So as the threat actors change what they're doing, you also have to change your defenses and, and be flexible to that. Um, the targeting of different infrastructures uh, does continue. Uh, transportation one year, retail the next year, hospitality the next, energy the next, and they'll just bounce from one to the other. Um, the biggest change I've seen in there is they've gone from the big companies, as we mentioned a few minutes ago, to smaller and medium-sized companies. I, I saw a company of three people uh, get ransomware, and they wanted $1,000 from each of the employees. So, you know, small potatoes, but still, a company like that's going to say, I don't have anything they want. I'm not a target. It's not necessarily true. Brian, yeah, I think you know because you know the need for cybersecurity has evolved because the adversaries has evolved as well, and and I think in you know twenty years ago we we did not see a lot of the more sophisticated attacks that we're seeing today, and also I think just from the when you look at the culture of the adversaries and threat actors, and you know they really evolved what they do to a business model. And it's not just a single actor that you're trying to defend against. It is almost like a business or a, you know, multiple levels of people that you're trying to, to work against. Because, uh, you know, just like we have businesses with roles and just like we have uh, tactical plans and we have strategic plans, uh, the adversary does as well. So we're definitely facing a more sophisticated, more capable, more adaptable enemy than we ever have in the cybersecurity space right now. So it's not that, you know, they may have specialized people that just all they do is phishing emails and that's all they do. And they get really, really good at it. And then once they are compromised an account, they may hand it off to someone who specializes in initial access to the network. 
then they may even sell it, sell that access or hand it off to another person. Their specialty is ransomware. And then when the ransomware is triggered, then, you know, it's someone that uh, does the negotiation, uh, you know, for the ransom. So, uh, you know, the need has evolved because our enemy has evolved. And I think we're still in, in the process of a, a very delicate chess game of trying to stay ahead of their tactics, adapt to their tactics, and it's really something difficult for us to get ahead. And I think that's what's led to a lot of challenges with many companies is, you know, do we have the budget, do we have the manpower, do we have the resources, capacity to stay ahead, you know, and adapt to an ever-changing enemy, uh, you know, that owns the battle space that they work in. Yeah. Real quickly, Keith, I would sure. add to that from, from a budget standpoint, if a breach is going to cost you probably three to 10 times what the proactive cost would have been to prevent something. Um, and hackers are, it's not like you see on TV. There's basically hacktivists, insiders, state sponsored, and organized crime. Of the organized crime and state sponsored, if they want you, they're going to get you. Uh, but the other two, it's more of a low hanging fruit thing. If you're not that low hanging fruit for your hacktivist, they're gonna move on. I mean, I, I did the certified ethical hacker and believe me, hacking itself is not the exciting thing you see on television. It, it's pretty mundane and tedious uh, chores to do. Um, so the idea is to get, you're always gonna have concerns. The idea is to get that comfort around two things, defenses and response. Are your defenses up to date? Are you, are you addressing what the threat actors are doing in their changes? And do you have a response in place if and when something happens and your, your detection goes off? And I, I do want to touch on a, on a story at some point on, on putting all your eggs in one basket, such as detection and kind of what the pitfalls are in doing something like that. But I'll talk about that in a moment. Okay. Jeff, before we leave this question, I wanted to follow up on one thing that you uh, tried to lead off with on your comments, which is um, business email compromise. And uh, it seems like the battlefield, in my opinion, or that's the part that affects me the most, is just a daily barrage of trying to decide which which one of these uh, emails are legitimate. It's almost like I'm a, you know, a counterfeit currency, you know, uh, guy trying to figure out why do you think uh, that has become such a big, big part of it? And and you pointed that out. To start with. Yeah, well, it, it goes back to your weakest link, and probably everyone's going to nod their head, especially if you're in IT. You know what the weakest link is, right? It's, it's your people. So if they can break that human link there, uh, they're, they're going to do that, and the way they do that is via email to gain your trust. People want to be helpful. They want to be friendly, and they play on that and get you basically to get someone to click on something or answer something that they shouldn't have. So it's kind of easy pickings, which again, comes back to the proactive side. Are you doing an awareness training program using a company or, or, or um, doing anything to, to not only make, to take that weakest link and make them your first line of defense instead and, under, and let them understand you're the weakest link. They're going to target you. We're in the service industry. You want to be helpful to people. They're going to play on that. So be cautious. So using that awareness program and, and making your end users your first line of defense is a good way to get get beyond that, or at least help get beyond that. And then hopefully your configurations and settings will detect something swiftly if something does get by. And, and, Thank you, Jeff. Keith, I appreciate that clarification. Oh, Brian, go ahead. Keith, I want to touch on something. You know, Jeff mentioned about trust. And I'll say one of the, the big trends we're seeing is, is our, our technical team, security team deals, uh, you know, with these types of situations day after day is the third party risk. You know, when we get an email that, you know, from an, an address we don't know, maybe we don't interact with a lot, you know, our trust meter automatically goes down. But if I get an email from, from Jeff or Keith, hey, my trust meter automatically goes up. And that's something that we're seeing a major trend with this third party risk, that it may not be you that's being compromised with somebody you know you interact with and do business. And I'm sure the adversary will go through an email account to see who they do business with. So it, it we've actually evolved from, you know, where business email com compromises aren't just coming from a random email, but they're also coming from people that we trust. And, you know, we have to be very, very careful about that because we, we may often get emails from that person. Uh, we almost often get attachments from that person. They may share files with us, but we still have to be careful because um, if someone else's account is breached uh, that, and they, you have a trusted relationship with them, that means they have an easier inroad into breaching your account or um, getting it to you as well. 
That sounds pretty sophisticated and uh, scary. Let's uh, let me ask the next question, and we'll go around. Uh, if you could put your finger on the top two or three threats in the current cybersecurity environment, what might they be, and how are cyber criminals using them? We just went over business email compromise, but um, Jack, start with what you're hearing from your clients and customers. Sorry, I'm unmuted now. Uh, yeah. You know, not to to beat a dead horse here on the email, but that that is the main one. Um, I would say eighty to ninety percent of of cyber attacks start in your inbox, um, whether it is link or attachment manipulation. You know, Brian talked about uh, the third parties. I mean, that we see that is, is extremely common. You know, you you email back and forth all day with somebody, and then you know the cyber criminals can watch that occur. And then jump in at some point, and they'll change. You know, if, if I'll change it an O to a zero or something like that in your email, and and you don't think anything of it because you're not looking at their email, and um, you know, it, it, that is the number one threat vector for sure. Um, we've seen some where it's like CEO or HR fraud. Well, they'll say, hey, this is your boss, um, such and such, and I need you to either transfer some funds here or sometimes they'll say buy gift cards and send them to this area. Um, and, and maybe, you know, you're an employee who doesn't interact often with the CEO or the HR manager. And so you think, okay, well, you know, this must be important if my boss is asking me to do it. Um, and they don't think twice that, you know, sending gift cards somewhere is, a, is an odd request. Um, and I mean, another one would be that your software is not up to date. I know uh, Jeff mentioned the low hanging fruit. I mean, it, if they're looking at a thousand different people to potentially hack and 12 of them, their software is blatantly out of date, uh, it, they're going to start there. Um, and that's something that I think Jeff and Brian can speak to more than myself. But that's really, those are the main two we're seeing. Jeff, you want to pick it up from there? Um, sure. Uh, yeah, absolutely. The, the patching is, is an issue. Patch management and, and outdated systems are, are an issue. And, and again, they're going to look for those things. Um, one thing that's what's old is new again. I've seen several cases in the last, let's say, 10 months or so where they're lurking, their dwell time is, is pretty long, which is why logs are so important. You want to know how long were they in the system before they actually took the action that, that you may have detected. Um, but they're looking for documents that they can counterfeit. Again, old school counterfeiting, as you mentioned, so such as checks. So someone sends a copy of a check and then they're just out there counterfeiting those checks and, and cashing them at banks. Um, again, you're not gonna get rich doing that, but it's a quick, easy win for the bad guys. Uh, you know, kind of a low tech, using high tech to do a low tech crime. Um, the other thing, not so much what's new, it's, it's more what the problem is. I mentioned going to a story. It's having a lot of good bells and whistles, which are great, don't get me wrong. Yeah, I'm all into prevention. I love being able to detect things and, 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 and find things, identify things that are happening. But if you don't know what to do with what you're being told uh, and don't have a response, I'll give you, for instance, when I first retired, one of the first uh, engagements I went on was a company that I went on site and he, this was in September. And he said, well, we saw the threat actor in our environment in June. So I'm thinking this is 2015. So I'm thinking June, July, August, September. It's actually not too bad. You detected it in four months at the time. Not bad. He says, no, no, no. June of last year. So it wasn't four months, it was 16 months they saw this guy in their environment. And I said, okay, well, what did you do? Where are your reports? What actions did you take? None, he didn't take any. Um, so he didn't escalate it, didn't do anything. They were looking at old stuff, he said. So the bottom line is what detected it was 12 terabytes of data left their environment. So they basically got everything. and. My point there is they had the bells, you know, they had the detection in place. They could see the green lights turn to red and say, uh oh, we got a problem. But they had no response plan in place of what do we do if and when this happens? And it sat there for 16 months until everything was basically gone. So the lesson in that is uh, as the threat editors continue to evolve, as we, I think each of us has said this now a, a couple of times, you've got to make sure that you've got that malleable bubble and you've got some type of response in place as well as uh, you know, just the detection. All those things are great, uh, but not knowing what to do with it. It's like, you know, if, if you know, you're on fire, what do you do? Everybody knows, right? 
stop, drop, and roll. Same thing. Something happens. Here's what we're going to do. Here's who we're going to bring in. Here's you know the expectations that are going to be set. And all this can be done with companies and, and having you know retainers and MSAs in place and all that kind of stuff. Hey Jeff, while you've got the floor, <clears throat> I want to go back to the old school uh, check copies that they're running mm -hmm. through. We don't have a banker really represented on the panel, but would something like the uh, positive pay services that the banks offer, uh, where you transmit the, the list of your payees and amounts, uh, would that help that situation uh, prevent it from occurring? Or what do you see to help stop those uh, fake checks going through? So would it help? A absolutely. All these things are going to help. Um, but again, it, it what, what what you have to look for is that dwell time. How long were they in the environment and seeing what are those lists? What are the limits of those checks? And they're just going to go right up to that amount. So if they're seeing that kind of information, um, it's helpful for sure. But if they've been in long enough to kind of see how, how it operates, who the signatures are, if there's two factor, what is the two factor? Uh, they'll do that. I mean, I watched, I watched 10 million go out the door one time on something similar to this. Wow. Um, Brian, Let's go to you and see what your thoughts are on that question. Well, I'm, I'm going to go a different direction. I think one of the, the biggest threat vectors is, is really human related, but it, it's change management. Um, a lot of times, it's change management and really configuration. Um, a lot of times we have done cybersecurity assessments um, with a lot of uh, even more mature organizations. And uh, you know they have all the tools available they need to secure the environment, but they don't always have them configured correctly. Um, Anytime you introduce technology to an environment, it is inherently insecure until you actually secure it. Um, you know, there are a lot of, uh, I'll give a great example, Office 365 is a great platform. There are a lot of security configurations and steps you need to take in that platform to make it secure. However, when you oh, when you start with that platform, it is not inherently secure. So, you know, we need to start going a little more in depth into configuring our systems to do uh, you know, make their house for their highest and best use to protect uh, the environment to see. I think the second thing, Keith, is we're seeing uh, the trend seems to be two stage attacks. Uh, you know, we saw this with uh, LastPass. You know, they had a they had a they they came forward with a breach uh, back in in early in late summer. Hey guys, nothing was wrong. We're okay. Uh, you know, nothing was breached. But then they come back here here in the last couple of months. And evidently, the adversary used the information they got from that attack and then allowed them to produce more attacks as well. So I think going back to the adversary, and they're being a lot more intentional about how they're attacking and what they're attacking. And, and that means they're getting smarter. And a lot of times, you know, we, we tend to look at ransomware or something like that as, as the attack. Uh, a lot of times, that's not the attack. You know, to Jeff's point, they've been, usually been there for quite some time and, and dwelled there. So. Um, I think we need to be really careful. A lot of these cloud applications and platforms that you subscribe to, you need to dig into the security settings and make sure you're doing everything you can uh, to secure those applications um, as far as what they provide you. And then as you make changes in your environment, you know, as you add new employees, as simple as that, or as you change systems, as you swap out firewalls, as you subscribe to new services, you need to have a process in place to uh, really mitigate any risk that you're bringing into your environment from there. Uh, that way, any risk they have may or may not transfer to yours. So those are, those are some vectors, I think, that, uh, you know, we need to pay attention to going forward. Okay, great, great question, uh, great answers to that question. Uh, we've already talked a good bit about email compromise, and our next question is along that same line. But this one, I, I would like to point towards maybe what do you see in companies do to protect against attacks? But as we just said, email is probably the greatest connector between all organizations. What are some growing ways in which email is becoming an increasingly significant threat? And here's the part I want us to focus on. What can we do to protect our organizations? against these emails or what what have you seen your customers doing uh, to try to overcome this just tsunami of emails and let's uh, start with jack yeah so one thing that we as a company have been recently is 
if an email does not come, if it's not from employee to employee, at the bottom of the email, we have a, a, a caution sign that reads, caution this emails from an outside source. Do not click links or open attachments unless you recognize the sender and know the content is safe. And that sounds like something that, you know, you'd see all day and you'd become numb to. Um, but when you're, uh, and I mentioned earlier when, you know, the, the cyber criminals are acting as a CEO or an HR manager, if you're emailing back and forth with your, with your boss and, I mean, you, and you never see that, and then all of a sudden on the seventh email that day, that pops up, it, it can get your attention. Um, so that's, that's one way that, that we've seen to help prevent. Another, and this has to do with invoice manipulation, which hackers will act like one of your third party vendors and say, hey, this is, you know, Tom over at such and such. I need you to Venmo, or not Venmo, <laughs> I need you to wire um, that money is $75,000 you owe me. And we have, you know, new wiring information and here it is. Um, so one way that we've seen people try and, and, and stop that is don't just assume that you're talking to Tom. I mean, first of all, wiring instructions don't change that often. That should be kind of an automatic red flag anyway. But we say, pick up the phone and call them and say, hey, I just got this email. And, you know, they'll either say, yes, it's, it's, that's accurate. We did change. Or they'll say, I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, and that can save you a, a large amount of, of headache in the long run. Thank you, Jack. Um, Jeff, what are your thoughts on um, what you're seeing in this area of protection schemes? So Brian touched on the configurations um, and, and levels of your license and you know, E3 license, E5 license, things like that that you can do yourself. Also understand what your vendors can do, uh, what they can do for you. Uh, but I mentioned it earlier, let's, let's make our end users our first line of defense. So I'm a big proponent of rewarding people who you know, were the most secure. Who was the most secure this year from my sales force, from my IT force, from my, you know, my executives? And, and you gauge that by you know, who did the best on the awareness training, who did the best on maybe if you, if you use a phishing company, know before or something like that, and, and, and didn't click on, on things that were sent. I would reward that behavior, you know, gift cards or something like that. On the flip side of that, if you have the same person over and over again who keeps doing poorly, um, your policy has to have some teeth. I mean, yeah, you take the training again. That's always someone's first thing to take this again. Um, but it has to have some teeth where, hey, you are a, a liability from the standpoint of security for our company and, and you need to take better action. And, 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 you know, again, there should be some repercussion for that if you have a, a habitual offender. Um, I think those kind of things help. Those are, those are really good points, and I appreciate you sharing those with us. Um, Brian, what, what do you think? Well, some of the things that we're doing uh, to protect clients uh, against, you know, any kind of email-based threat, I mean, you know, one thing, making sure 365, if you're using that platform, is configured um, according to best practices. There are uh, quite a few uh, standards you can look at and utilize uh, to configure your system. CIS has a great uh, foundation benchmark that you can go down. It's about 20 to 30 different settings that you can do uh, to make sure your, your platform is configured right. Um, can't say enough about security awareness training and education. 100% agree with what Jeff said about you know, rewarding people uh, for you know, good progress on that. One thing I think we're try also trying to do is give the ability for the end user to actually report an email and get feedback on it. Um, you know, once the email gets to their inbox, all those protections and all those configurations and all those things you can put in place, you know, have been uh, overcome. And it's now up to them. You know, they make a decision right there and now what to do with that email in their inbox. Well, uh, we give them an out. You know, we give them a phone or friend. So we we do use no before. Uh, we give our clients the official order button. Uh, they can use that, and uh, and we do have you know the ability for that to go to our security team, and then our security team has some more advanced tools to analyze the email and then give feedback to them like, hey, great job, you caught a phishing email, and let them know, hey, give them some positive reinforcement, make them part of the solution, uh, not necessarily trying to trick them with a phishing simulation, but also if they did, if it isn't a bad email, we can send it back to them and say, hey, this one checked out clean, and they can go about their day. So I think. That's one thing extra we're doing. Uh, you know, we're rolling out and piloting with a lot of clients 
is giving them the ability to report that, having our security team analyze it, and then give them some feedback on, uh, you know, what that looks like. And then we're also taking some additional steps past that. And, you know, if we see that multiple people are actually reporting the same email or there's a trend or pattern in the emails they are reporting, uh, we'll roll that back into the email security program to uh, attempt to block any further um, you know, examples of that email or that domain as they're trying to send uh, to the organization. So trying to take it a step further, uh, trying to use the tools we have, but also empower uh, the end user to be, hey, we need them to be part of the solution, that human firewall, building that culture security uh, by giving them the ability to actually report it and get feedback. Yeah, I, I think IT has done a good job of dispensing with the, the notion that IT is the shop of no. You know, they always ask for no, no, no. I mean, granted, you're about business enablement, enabling yourselves, enabling your business to conduct its business and be as profitable as possible and as successful as possible. Um, but they were, you know, very recently seen as a shop of no. Every time they ask for something, it's no. And can I do this? And no. Um, so I think, again, explaining why uh, you're doing things and then making them part of your team is, is great. Um, there is a there is a message. There were a couple of them. I, I see one it says, what about the crazy text messages? How can you uh, protect your um, phone from these? Um, I, I, I can take that now. And I say that only because I was a big phone guy back with Secret Service, one of the first four or five in the country that even did phone forensics and, and, that, and tracking wireless devices and that kind of thing. Um, the problem with phones is, and I've got this huge chart on, on how IT tries to handle everything and phones being part of it is, um, the best practices that people have with their computers, you know, you don't click on something you don't recognize. If you see a URL that says .ru, you don't click on it because it's coming from Russia and we don't do business in Russia, you know, that kind of thing. Those best practices don't translate into phones. And it's kind of a weird thing. It's partially on IT and awareness, but it's the end user looks at it like, okay, well, security is either T-Mobile's or, you know, at and or whoever your carrier is, or it's Samsung or Apple or whoever your hardware device is, the, the maker of the hardware. Um, or it's the app, you know, whoever created this app, they put the security in it, or my IT, but it's never you. You know, people think their phones are secured by someone else other than themselves. Unlike computers, they recognize that their laptop, they're kind of responsible for both physical and, and the cyber software security of it. That doesn't translate in the phone, so it's, it's, it's strange that way. Uh, so the question on how do you fix that, there's a lot of M, you know, mobile device management, mobile application management, mobile, you know, uh, there's like four or five different mobile type management solutions. It depends on how heavy handed and how much you want to be involved, but you should definitely have something on your mobile devices uh, to help your end users uh, stay secure on those. But the same rules apply. If you're getting emails on your phone, you don't recognize them. Uh, there's a couple other telltale signs that something's going on with your phone. If it's hot when you pick it up and you haven't been using it, there's an indication that something's going on. Your phone's communicating and you're not using it, but there's something going on there. So there's a lot of different things you can look you can look for, um, but it is still the end users uh, needs needs to take those same uh, laptop best practices and put them on their phones and use those for their phones. I hope that answers the question. We can get a little deeper into it if we need to, but. Um, as far as the question uh, that was asked, hopefully that'll answer it. Uh, you should power your phone off, power cycle it once in a while. Uh, if you don't, um, things will you know, start, first of all, won't run as well. But secondly, if there is something on your phone that's malicious, a lot of times just the reboot will wipe that off of there and it's gone. So you should definitely power cycle probably once a week. Jeff, thank you for picking up that question. And I've noticed we've got some really good Q&A questions and um, so I'm, I'm anxious to get to those as well. Uh, I wanted to, I think we've done a good job of discussing email. I wanna move to a new area now uh, with our next question, which is uh, a greater number of newsworthy cyber attacks have talked about two specific areas, third party risk and supply chain attacks. Uh, can you discuss these further, maybe even, you know, define those and how organizations might mitigate those kind of risk? I know supply chain really became an issue during COVID. So uh, let's go back to Jack, see if you have some thoughts on that question. 
Yeah, absolutely. So Brian touched on the third party risk a little bit earlier. Um, I, I would say one way to, to help mitigate that is to, to interview your, your third party vendors and make sure that they have the proper, whether it's cybersecurity or cyber insurance in place. Um, we, we're seeing a lot more um, people require that you have certain limits on your cyber insurance before they'll even do business with you. Um, and I would say that especially if, if you're dealing with the vendor very frequently, that is something and, or, you know, and you rely on them heavily, I would definitely uh, look into that. And that's something you can get your vendors to do. I would say for, for yourself, a lot of cyber policies will have something called contingent business interruption, which means that if you want, if you rely heavily on a third party vendor to, to do your day to day operations, and if they are the victim of a cyber attack and they're down for a week, which means you can't do your work or your business and you're losing money, that that limit can kick in and that coverage can can take place and, and can, you know, help you when it's it could be an extreme headache if you don't have that in place. OK, Jeff, you want to talk a little bit about that and um, see what your experience has been with third party and supply chain? Sure. So I think one of the big issues here from a preparation standpoint is some type of readiness and understanding, uh, you know, what are your limitations? What are your vendors limitations? What happens if they go down? Um, as Jack was just mentioning, I've done several um, transportation logistics companies related to supply chain. Uh, the biggest fear I've seen that they have is they're down for 24, 36, 48 hours, you know, their drivers will, just, they'll go to another, you know, they want their trucks full. That's how they get paid. Right. So they're pulling up to you and you can't load their trucks because your system's down. They'll just find, they'll go to another app and find another distribution center. They'll go there. The question is, will you get those drivers back? Um, so the impact is huge uh, from uh, the standpoint of that logistics company. Uh, you know, people talk about, well, we're not going to get our goods. Obviously, that, that's a problem as well. But from the individual logistics company or transportation company, supply chain company, uh, it, it's, it's critical that they, they're not down a long time. So that, there's where the readiness comes in in the, in the third party. You know, if something happens to them, how is it going to affect you? Um, and is there, a, is there a way that you can go elsewhere or, or use backups? I, I, people went to pad and paper. They want the old clipboards and papers, how they continue working. Well, do you have that capability? Um, and, and how robust is it? Is it just one facility or all your facilities can do this? What's your communications look like? Was it affected? Can you communicate with those other facilities via email? Uh, if, you know, if not, what's your backup? Do you, you know, are you going to go to Gmail if your internal email is down? Uh, you might want to have those in, in your readiness and response plan. Um, so the, you know, there's a lot of it. Uh, that we've done. I can't speak to them in, in specifics, but I think the readiness exercises and, and tabletops, again, all that proactive stuff that we've talked about, uh, it's, it's got to be done so that you'll, you'll know at least uh, have an idea of what you'll do when, if and when this happens. Thank you for that. Um, Brian, what about you? Um, what are you seeing in this area? Well, I think, I think it's important to remember that, you know, the risk that we, you know, look at with our organizations does not exist in the silo. And then, you know, every time that we conduct business or we sign on uh, for a service, um, did, even down to the point that we download a piece of software uh, to, to our computers that we may use in their day-to-day, -day, uh, you know, work, you know, we are, we are absorbing the risk of that relationship. And we have to have the processes and the means, uh, you know, to assess that risk and determine how are we going to handle it. Are we going to absorb it? Are we going to just assume it? Or are we going to, uh, you know, investigate and, and make sure that hey, this person we, this organization we're going to partner with or we're going to buy software from, you know, have they got their security house in order? Because once that transaction takes place their risk and some of their risk will transfer over to you and you will have that risk as well. And for supply chain, you know, we generally usually think of supply chain as, uh, you know, the, those steps that, you know, brings goods or services to our door. But in the software world, you know, it really has to do with development environment. Uh, you know, we saw um, they, you know, you look back at the solar wind, uh, you know, supply chain attack where, hey, the adversary, 
you know, infiltrated the development process of a, a major remote management software that was installed in who knows how many government agencies. And, you know, that's something we have to be careful. Supply chain doesn't just mean transportation logistics, but also means software. So if you're a company who is developing software, if you're a company who's subscribing to develop software or have engaged you know, someone develop an app for you, you need to understand the risks associated with that and understand, hey, how are they securing their source code? How are they securing their repositories? You know, are there, dev are there de developers uh, practicing good cyber hygiene? Um, are there controls around, uh, you know, moving code from repositories to production? Uh, so there, there's a lot of things I believe that are, are being missed in, in that area, you know, and I think that's what's led to what we have seen some of the more newsworthy breaches recently, uh, Slack, LastPass, and a couple others, these software companies getting hit uh, because they're not doing a good job of securing environments and developing environments. So, so think of that not just from logistics, but also software, because that is basically works the same way. And we need to be really careful what kind of risk we're taking on uh, with cloud applications, cloud platforms. Ask the hard questions. Hey, what is their disaster recovery plan? Do they have a a SOC 2 or SOC 3 report, you know, do they go through regular penetration testing? How do they handle vulnerabilities in, in their own software? Do they, how do they communicate uh, risk with their environment? Uh, you know, those questions are, are just a short list of things that you need to ask companies as you engage them to either develop or as you subscribe uh, to their software and services. Thanks for that. You know, while we're, while we're on that topic, I, I think the most disturbing one of these uh, to me is the last pass. You know, um, all the wisdom that we've picked up on is don't use the same password, don't use easy passwords, which led to, okay, well, now I've got a, I need a different password for every app or every program, it, which eventually leads to, well, I got to put that in a database. I can't remember all those passwords, which then becomes really a honeypot for uh, the hackers to break into. Um, uh, I wish uh, one of y'all would speak a little bit to what happens when LastPass, uh, you know, gets broken into. You rush out and change all your passwords or you make sure two-factor authentication is on. Um, who's, who's got some feedback on that? Keith, I can, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, you know, we, we saw them experience a breach, I think it was back in August. Um, you know, they came out and said, hey, no customer data was actually stolen. But lo and behold, what they didn't know is the adversary was just pulling whatever they could. And then they came back and attacked them later and ultimately stole um, some archive copies of password vaults. Um, and because they're archive copies, it, you know, it didn't really matter what your, you know, they, they recommended, hey, you need to change your master password. Well, I'm sorry, but if you still an archive copy, whatever your master password was, it's still there and all the passwords information and now they said they were encrypted and it was very hard to break but i know i talked with one company uh that used LastPass, and and you know both personally and professionally i mean they they had uh, put an eight character password on it they were not using msa so again i think it was back to configuration you know I, i'm i use a password manager you know uh you know i still think LastPass is a good solution but i still think you need to take some ownership and, uh, you know, some responsibility, making sure all the security features um, are uh, enabled, make sure that your master password that you use to unlock your password vault is uh, is very secure and is be a, probably a passphrase, not a password, uh, because that does unlock everything. But, I um, mean, you know, when you look at LastPass or RoboForm or uh, Keeper, I mean, uh, you know, all those are, are good products. Um, you know, unfortunately, LastPass was one that got breached. They obviously had some, uh, I think, some, again, bad development practices that led to, uh, you know, some of their code being stolen. And they used that code, uh, the adversary used that code to, you know, do and orchestrate an additional attack to that. But I'm still a big fan uh, of password managers. I use one myself. I use Keeper. Uh, not saying it's any better than anything out there, but, um, but I still have to take some ownership responsibility to uh, securing it uh, both with a really strong master password and things like MFA and uh, being careful who you share it out to. Well, thank you for clearing that up. It's just one that's bugged me a lot. Um, <laughs> moving on to the next question, and this is going to kind of be um, in the insurance area. How is maintaining cybersecurity coverage beneficial for an organization 
What are some ways in which an organization might rely too heavily on cybersecurity insurance? And I'd like for Jack to um, start on that one. Thanks, Keith. Yeah, it's beneficial for for a number of reasons. Um, I mean, the peace of mind at the end of the day is, is the number one thing. Um, but I don't think that people realize just how costly a, a, a cyber crime event can be. You know, they they think, okay, well, if they hack into my system and, and they require, you know, $50,000 to get me back up and running, I'd rather pay that than pay $8,000 a year for, for my cyber insurance. Well, what they don't realize is, you know, they, they have to pay the $50,000 for the ransom, which they may not even get them back up and running if you pay the $50,000. They have to pay for, you know, if they get in there and, and have access to your client's information, you have to notify any individuals who are affected by that, which can be very costly. If you're down for two weeks, um, the, the lost income of two weeks of business interruption, which I touched on earlier, I mean, two weeks, that's you're looking at 4% of your annual revenue out the door from an event. Um, also, you know, if, if they, let's say they, they cause enough damage to your computers themselves, uh, there's something called bricking cost, which pays for your computers and your, and your hardware itself to, to get back up and running. Um, and if, if you lose data in that um, event as well, that the cost to recover that is also built into a cyber policy. So you start adding all that up and we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars, not just the one off 30, 40, $50,000 that they're asking for. I know Jeff mentioned earlier that they're, that they're lowering uh, their price. Um, and maybe, and you can speak more to that, Jeff, on, on why they're doing that. I would think because they're just, they're starting to realize that, that I guess 10 million is not, uh, it's not going to happen very often. Um, I'll let you talk on that a little bit more in a minute. But, um, you know, the second half of that question is how how my people rely too heavily on on their insurance. I've, I've mentioned earlier the, the add-on coverage that a lot of carriers, standard carriers, are, are putting into their policies. Um, it, these are low-limit add-ons. I, I mentioned sometimes $50,000 of just kind of throw-in coverage that's cheap. And people say, all right, well, I've got that. I'm, I should be good. Um, and the coverage there is pretty bare um, and it's not going to cover, you know, for instance, in that, that one I just described where there's five different things you got to pay for, they may pay for one of those. Um, and you're still out a ton of money and, you, and when you thought you would be covered. Um, and, and we really, we don't see people rely on their insurance too heavily. It's more they rely too heavy on their cybersecurity itself. They'll say, you know, I've got the most up-to-date software. I got an IT team. Uh, we're on the cloud is one I hear a lot. You know, they think the cloud is, is untouchable. Um, you know, our systems are, are backed up in an offsite location. I mean, they'll, they'll list off eight to 10 things, reasons why they don't need to purchase the cyber insurance. And, and you know, if I've tried to explain why you still need it and maybe it's not getting through, I'll, I'll, I'll end it by saying, well, talk to your IT person and see if they think you should purchase this. And they almost all call me back a few days later and like, yeah, he said we should buy this. And it's just the reality of you, these, these two things, the cybersecurity and the cyber insurance, they, they're meant to work in tandem, not, not just have one or the other. Um, you know, you, you want to do everything you can to prevent something from occurring, which is, you know, Brian's specialty, but you also want to, if something does happen, have that safety net on the back end. And by the way, if you do all the things on the front end, um, and we'll talk about this in the next question um, about things that you should be doing, you know, the MFA, Brian mentioned, there's a few more I'll, I'll talk about in the next question. But if you do all those things, it's going to make your cyber insurance much cheaper. So that just, it, it's, it's more speaking more to, towards these, these two things are supposed to work in conjunction, not be just completely separate things in, in your mind. Great answer. Can I add to that a little bit? Keith? Jeff, you're next up. Go right ahead. <laughs> yeah. So I don't want to be the Debbie Downer here, but there's other things, breach coach costs, the cost of teaming from an incident responder like myself, teaming with your guys for two to six weeks sometimes, which pushes back any projects they're working on. They can't do it mm -hmm. in the middle of, you know, it, it, of a breach so you're losing money there and you're losing you know your, your time timetable there uh so you've reached coach and negotiation firm 
so much comes into play, reputation, loss of customers, in addition to all, all the things that Jack said. But the, the silver lining to all of this is when you understand all of that, and I'll go back to a story. There's one client I've had in almost eight years now in the private sector and doing this in, the, in Secret Service as well. I would go work for this gentleman any day. He understood all of that and he appreciated the work that was being done. He, he didn't like some of the things I was saying or my team was saying that his team was also saying, but he understood that this is the reality of it. He understood his guys needed to sleep. While he'd love to see work continue, he told all his guys, go take the next six hours off. I want you to take naps. You know, whatever the case may be, bottom line is he had his employees, he trusted them uh, and, and understood what they were doing and understood what it was going to take because he he looked at all these things that you know Jack just mentioned and Brian's mentioned and I'm mentioning, understood how it was going to work uh, and and was was able to parlay that into a just a great um, example of leadership. Um, and the stress level of everybody, when you go through a compromise or a breach, it's, it's very high. And to be able to bring that down, which is part of my job, but having the CEO of that company, uh, as well as the breach coach, bringing everyone down made it so much better. Uh, and that's one of, you know, we throw all these doom and gloom things out there and all these things you have to think about. And it's like, you know, oh my gosh, how do I get my head around this? You can. And again, it's, it's that you're always going to have those concerns, but having that comfort around if it ever hits the fan, this is who I'm going to call. This is what's going to happen. And, and being able to be that leader, IT leader, corporate leader, CEO, CF, whoever it is, uh, and, and, and take people through that and lower that stress and, and, and chaos, you'll really appreciate it when the time comes. Jeff, while you're this close to, to that topic, could you give us all a little peek behind the scenes of what it, what does happen? I mean, from, I'm sure we got people on the call that have not had a breach and have no concept of what would happen. Uh, can you give us a little peek behind the scenes of, of how it goes down and what the phone calls like and those kind of things? <laughs> sure. And I'll try not to take too much time. Um, so the first thing is going to be detection, right? Did you detect it? Did your MSP, MSSP detect it? Did someone in a blue windbreaker knock on your door and say you've been compromised? You know, how, how did you find out that you had something? So there's detection. And then it's going to be from an internal standpoint, well, what's happened? Uh, can we even tell? Uh, and let's just say it's ransomware. Usually the ransomware, they're going to say it affected one or two systems, and it turns out it affected a dozen, you know, the 20 uh, we find out later. But your first call is going to probably, you know, once internally you're synced, is either going to be to, to one of three, sometimes four. You're probably not going to call law enforcement first. They're going to tell you to. I used to when I was a secret service, hey, call us first. Now that I'm not in law enforcement, probably not your first call, but can be an early call depending on, on what type of event it is. Um, is it going to be to your outside counsel, your breach coach? Is it going to be to your carrier or your broker uh, for cyber coverage? Or is it going to be to your incident response firm? Who, who is that going to be? Um, and, and again, a lot of that's up to you. I would say call your incident response firm first. It sounds self-serving because obviously that's me. Um, the only reason I say that is if you have a breach coach, they're written in stone, that's who you're going to use. If you have cyber insurance, that's written in stone, that's who you're going to file a claim with, right? What's not written in stone is your incident responder. So, but that is still your choice. As long as they're part of the panel, your insurance carrier's panel, so if you're with Chubb or Travelers or whatever insurance company you're with, as long as the company you want to use for IR is on their panel, that's going to be fine. What happens is if you call one of the other people first, and it's fine if you do, um, they're probably just going to go down a list and say, okay, we used you know, PwC and then we used Deloitte. Okay, this time we're going to use Verizon. And they're going to say, well, get them on the phone in 30 minutes. Be ready for a phone call, scoping call. And you're going to say, okay. Because you've got so many things, so many balls in the air, you're not going to fight it. Um, but remember, it's your choice. So if you tell them, let's say you call your insurance company first and say, hey, we think we've got something here uh, and we would like to use you know, Strauss Reaper. So you're going to call me. They're probably going to say fine. If you've got, and this is the, one of the keys to it, having some type of a retainer or master, zero dollar retainer, whatever, master services agreement in place, sets legal terms and conditions in place that may take days sometimes to negotiate. You do not want to go through that when you're hemorrhaging data or your system's down. So get retainers in place. I say retainers, more than one. Got it with me? Great. I'm your first call. Would love that. If I'm not, 
and, and you know, call somebody else first and they can take it great. Sometimes companies will get too busy, smaller companies will get too busy, they can't handle any more work. So you need that second fire department, that second plumber, that second electrician on your speed dial. You have that and all those legal terms and conditions are already in place. All we do now is we get on a scope and call. And if you called me, I'm gonna ask you two questions. Do you have breach coach or, or counsel? Yes, let's get them on the phone and get this under privilege. Do you have cyber coverage? Yes, who's it with so I can get the rates proper in the statement of work. We're gonna get on a call. You're gonna to explain to us, hey, here's what we have seen. We have seen this happen so far. Here's the steps we've taken, right? And then we're gonna scope out what we need to do. And then it goes to everybody for signature and we're off and running. It gets you that team in place, the team with your people, much quicker by having those things in place. If, if they're not, it delays things. And again, causes that stress level and that chaos to go up because the first thing the CEO is, okay, as soon as you call, what can you tell us now? Well, we're still negotiating the legal terms and conditions and nobody wants to do that. So that's how it's going to kick off. So the more smoothly you can make that, the better. After that, it's a matter of, you know, disk analysis, log analysis, malware reverse engineering, bringing in a, a, a ransomware negotiation firm, uh, business impact quantification potentially, e-discovery for you know, notification if it's PHI or PII or whatever data may have been compromised. All those entities then come into play, which most of your response firms can bring those, those resources to bear for you. But that's a lot I just said very quickly, so yeah, I, no, I apologize, well, but great, yeah. yeah. But to, no, I appreciate to, you doing that. Okay, Jack. To, to jump in there, Keith, and I haven't even talked about the incident response team aspect of, of the insurance. And you know, Jeff mentioned earlier that the cyber criminals, it's not like you see in the movies. I would say from, from where I sit as the agent, the incident response team is kind of like you see in the movies, at least from where I sit. I mean, it, you, you call a number and there's, I don't, you can tell me the exact numbers, Jeff, but six to 10 people, I guess, sometimes who are just sitting there waiting for that phone call. And they immediately start diving into all the things that, that Jeff just mentioned. I, I mean, if you don't have that in place and ready to go, it, like Jeff mentioned, you can lose so much time and money. Um, and with all of these, uh, most of these cyber policies, that is that comes with it. And it is it's it's truly invaluable. We had uh, uh, one person who had a, a cyber claim and you know we call the incident response team we get on the phone and they call us back an hour later after they kind of done a little bit of research and they're like yeah you know we uh we've seen this guy before i, I deal with him all the time we'll, we'll have you back up and running in two days it's it's that kind of experience and and um knowledge is invaluable when you're because you know it, he knew exactly who this person was and how to deal with them. Whereas if it had been some, you know, random person or you call and you're still trying to, to negotiate rates or whatnot, um, it could be a, a significant time difference. So I just wanted to, to speak to, to just how incredible those incident response teams are. And, and I'm sure, you know, everybody would appreciate it if you're once something happens like that. Well, this is a fast one. Yeah, Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, one thing I would say from just to push out to all your employees, usually in ransomware, there's a timetable. There's a time clock. We talked about it a little bit earlier. In the Secret Service, they used to say we have a one voice policy and it's not yours. You should have that same thing go out to your employees. Do not answer that threat actor. It will start the clock. And you don't want that clock started until you got your ducks in place, ducks in a row from instant responder, outside counsel that negotiation firm that I talked about a moment ago. Um, if they if they respond back to them, it will start that clock and you don't want that to happen until you're absolutely ready for it to happen. So tell your people not to, not to do that. Well, listen, this is uh, amazing information, but I can tell right away that um, if you have to start this process after you've been hit, you're behind the eight ball. Uh, so, uh, Brian, uh, give some comments on, uh, you know, how do you plan for this? I mean, it's obvious to me that there's got to be a plan now uh, just to get this legal agreement negotiated, if nothing else. I mean, so, to identify certain parties. So just to, Lynn, going back to the question about, you know, first of all, relying too heavily on cybersecurity insurance. Cybersecurity insurance is just, you know, one, you know, lever or dial that you need to have available to you in case there's a problem. 
And, you know, to, to put that in perspective, we all have insurance in our cars. But because we have insurance, it doesn't mean we don't wear a seatbelt. It doesn't mean we don't stop or buy a safe car. And this is no different. Uh, so, you know, there's always uh, steps we need to take, uh, not just securing the environment, but, you know, it's good to have the conversations about preparation, you know, for, uh, for a breach or for a, a ransomware attack. Um, you know, in a lot of ways, companies may even take the perspective depending on what environment they're in, the risk that they're, they have is just, hey, you have to assume breach, you know, or do you have the controls in place? A lot of that time that may start with just an assessment to see where you stand. Um, I think it's good to, hey, have the tough conversations internally. Uh, you know, it, it, it can't just, these conversations also cannot just remain within the IT team. Um, you need to pull stakeholders in, you need to pull the managing partners in, you need to pull the CEOs, the CFOs, the legal team, the marketing department. Hey, all these people are, are going to be critical in the incident response process from your perspective uh, and from your point. So, you know, this this has to, to uh, move out to, to a, an organizational or business approach. But I think a lot of times I see these discussions just remain internal to the IT team or maybe with the managed service provider because we all assume that cybersecurity, um, unfortunately, is, an, is a technology problem. But as you can see from what Jeff said, all the people involved, Jack said it too, hey, you got to have legal people involved. You got to have people making business decisions involved. You know, that that is not something the IT team is capable of doing. So I would say if you're, you know, from a, a standpoint of being in technology, Hey, you've got to start involving the entire organization in a broader conversation about cybersecurity. And ultimately, cybersecurity needs to be a big part of your overall risk conversation, you know, for the organization. You know, if, if you're, if you, we all should be identifying the risk within our organization. It could be fire, it could be weather, it could be, you know, a natural disaster, whatever it may be. Cyber needs to be in that conversation. And we need to proliferate that conversation throughout the business and make it an organizational effort, not just a technology effort. And that's the way you need to approach preparation for it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think that was very stimulating conversation. I want to get uh, these last two questions in quickly. Um, but Jack, uh, preparing for more stringent cybersecurity insurance requirements, what are some specific areas that business leaders need to focus on in their organization's cybersecurity policy. I know we've been getting some, some questionnaires that are coming from insurance companies before the new coverage is issued. Uh, maybe that's uh, referring to that, but fill us in on that. So, and I, I saw a question in the chat talking about, and, and Jeff answered it a little bit, the, the cost of cyber insurance is consistently increasing. In my banking industry, do you project continued increases and would you care to project percentage cost increase? I, I would say, you know, and Jeff mentioned it's leveled off a little bit. It has leveled off a little bit. Um, I, I still expect it year over year. You need to expect that number to go up from a percentage standpoint, more than any other line of your insurance. Um, we are, you know, there, there are some carriers um, in Europe who have all together, who, who were kind of, the pioneers of some of this cyber stuff and they've taken so heavy losses some are considering getting out of cyber altogether because they're just not making any money on it um and i would say the, the rising cost of premium is a direct reflection on the rising risk i mean that that's all insurance is is that when they give you a premium is that's their that represents how likely they think a claim is to occur and the reason it keeps going up is because claims continue to go up not only in frequency but in severity um, it, some ways that you can kind of be proactive um, and ways that'll help get your costs down is, and, and Brian talked about earlier, the multi-factor authentication um, or MFA, which is essentially if you're trying to log into your computers, it'll send a notification to a second device, usually your cell phone, that says, are you trying to log into your computer? And you say yes. Um, that is something that a lot of carriers are requiring now and will not write your insurance at all, your cyber insurance at all, if you do not have MFA. Others will still write you, but it'll cost you a lot more money. Um, another thing you can do is have your, your IT team scan your website. Um, carriers are doing this. I'm not sure what goes into the scanning of a website. I'll let Brian talk more on that. Um, but uh, to scan it to see if they can breach it, because if they can breach your website, 
a cyber criminal can definitely boost your website. So there, that, that will cost you more premium. Um, you can run a phishing simulation, which, which also Brian talked about earlier. Um, we run them in house here and it'll give you a report on, you know, two of your 44 employees clicked on it. Here are the two. And, and, you know, it's not meant to, we don't send an email out bashing the two people who clicked the email. Um, it, it's a learning experience for those people. Um, and it can also be eye opening to the business owners who say, my people will never click on something that obvious. And, and then you say, well, seven of them just did in the last two hours. Um, and they're like, okay, well, maybe this is a bigger deal than I thought. Um, you can run a, a, a system scan to see if there's any open ports, which once again, I have no idea what that means, but carriers are saying it's very important. And I'll once again, call Brian to, to, have, that, uh, to have that be done. Um, it's also important to, to get the cyber coverage in place before you have a claim. Um, if, if, you, if you have a claim and then you try and get insurance, not only will the premiums be much higher, but the underwriting process is a much more of a headache. They're going to ask you a million questions about the incident and what occurred and, and what steps are being done to prevent that from happening again and so on and so forth. Um, I would say that those, those four or five bullet points are, are the most, but premiums still in general are, are going to continue to go up. Thanks, uh, Jeff. Add to that. I mean, I'm sure you've got some thoughts on on that process. What what would you like to add? Well, <clears throat> there were nine things that uh, the insurance underwriters were looking for, say, a year ago, 18 months ago, um, and it's 12 now. Um, so they're adding as they get more sophisticated and get a little more granular in what they're looking for. One of the things they used to ask for was, do you have MFA? And people, it was just yes or no. So people would check the box, yes, when really they didn't have it across the entire environment, they just had it on their admin accounts, but it was still a yes. Uh, well, they're learning. Um, so now it's, do you have MFA, you know, and to what extent do you have it? So there, are, there is a list of 12 things, and Jack can probably provide them to you, I can provide them to you, whatever, that they're looking for. Uh, and again, from a roadmap perspective, most IT people are going to look at all 12 of them and say, yeah, we're working on them. We have these four, we're working on these three now, and then the other ones we're going to get to. Uh, they understand that it, when you fill out your, your, your supplemental or whatever, it's we have these things or here's the level we have these things. Uh, and that's going to help, as Jack mentioned, getting, getting the price down as, as well. Um, so anything you can do to get those premiums down, the retainers and things that you have in place, I'll, I'll mention that one more time. Just just to let people understand that you know, firms like Brian's, we're going to work with them. And when, when you have an MSA or a retainer in place, we're going to say, okay, you know, who, who do you, I mean, we use Brian's uh, abacus. Okay, great. Here's what they do. Here's where their skills and limitations stop or their, their services stop and where ours would pick up. So it's kind of like a get to know you call or get to know you WebEx that we would have so that you're familiar with what we need when we would come in we're familiar with what you do as as a company and then also what brian's firm does as a company so that we can hit the ground running and have those uh, have those things in place already so anything that you can show like that from product standpoint is going to help i think in jack's world to get, get you the better rates there's no doubt um and and as you mentioned the filling out an application with all the different questions most people get their it people to fill that out for them anyway so <laughs> IT people like Brian know, you know, every single one of the questions on the application generally can affect the premium. And so, and, and IT people like Brian know what they're looking for on a day-to-day -day basis. So it, having that can, it, it helps a lot to have someone to lean on and know what these insurance carriers are, are looking for. Well, since um, since we've referred to Brian a couple of times, I mean, he was explaining to me the number of clients that are forwarding the insurance questionnaire to him. Uh, Brian, give us an update on the changes that you're seeing, the number of questionnaires you're picking up, how you're helping in that area. Uh, yeah, I mean, going back to what Jeff said on how the questionnaires have evolved over the years, um, you know, they definitely have gotten more detailed. Uh, they're asking, uh, you know, more, I would say, probing questions, uh, not just about whether you have MFA, but, uh, you know, at what levels is, is MFA implemented. Um, they're also asking about, you know, security awareness training. 
uh, you know, beforehand they said, hey, do you do anything to actually, you know, educate your employees? Now we're getting, hey, what platform do you use? How often do you do phishing simulations? And how often do you assign training? Uh, so we're getting a lot more detailed questions, um, you know, with those. I do get a lot of them. Jack is right. I get a ton of these sent our way uh, simply because we, you know, clients don't know how to answer the questions. We're obviously their service provider and we help them through that process. And, and I'll say we have actually used, you know, these questionnaires as they come in to really tailor our services to clients to, to match those requirements. So, you know, a couple of years ago, they weren't talking about, you know, enhanced uh, detection and response endpoint protection. Well, now that's a standard question, or do you use that? So we, we've modified our offering to, you know, to match that. So we've actually used some of these questionnaires as a roadmap for offering services to client to make sure that, hey, if they do get a questionnaire, that, you know, those boxes can be checked, at least based on the services that uh, we are providing them. So uh, they're definitely getting uh, more detailed. Uh, they're asking harder questions. I think we are going to continue to see uh, them do some independent scanning uh, especially of the perimeter, it is not hard. Uh, and I know this because we, we do this during assessments to determine, hey, what is your, your local IP address? You know, if you got an AT&T or charter coming to your building, uh, that IP address is public. It's not hard to find usually. Uh, and therefore, you know, they can use the same tools we use and the same tools the adversary use, uh, you know, to scan, you know, your perimeter and see if you do have anything open maybe you don't know about. Um, and I got a feeling you're probably going to see, you know, if you want coverage, uh, you're probably going to see some more, uh, you know, some harder questions. Uh, you may even, you know, someone may show up even on site one day uh, to, to really see, okay, we've got these controls. Well, let's, let's confirm them. Let's have a conversation about them and, and see exactly uh, to test them and see to make sure they are there. So um, it is definitely something that is evolving. Uh, it's something we're definitely trying to keep up with as we get these questionnaires. Like I said, we're trying to say, okay, well, we know this is coming. Let's go ahead and stay ahead of it. And, uh, and it's really gotten us to a point that where when we, we talk to clients about cybersecurity services, uh, we have a standard and you, know, you pretty much have to subscribe to that standard. That standard is usually based on a cybersecurity uh, you know, questionnaire that Jack or, or Jeff's group put out. I mean, that's what we use is, hey, this is the minimum. And, and I think as you look at that questionnaire, you know, you'll see that, hey, that's the minimum to get coverage because we do believe security, cybersecurity insurance is a great investment. Um, you know, for any organization, we want them to be able to get that covered um, if they want to pursue that. But but it's and, definitely something we keep, we're keeping an eye on. Yeah, and and these cyber policies, I haven't talked too much about this, but they are evolving every single day. New exclusions, uh, new limitations, uh, new coverages. It is every single day. There's there's something different, and and some people don't know about these changes. Uh, I was I was talking with a prospect a few weeks ago who was describing invoice manipulation and, and he said that we were told that there's nothing you can do about this. And I said, well no, there there is a there is a product. Um, and and that's part of the evolution of of these policies is is they're ever changing. And really the best way to to know what you're looking at is to either have myself or Brian or a Jeff look at your policy and say, you know, this policy is excluding what, you know, social engineering, and that's the number one thing that we're seeing, or whatever it may be, you need to have, because someone can put in front of you six different quotes, and you just pick the the cheapest one, usually is the way that, that people, or the second cheapest one, um, but it could be excluding something that is your number one threat vector, and it, it, then you're paying for something that you're never even going to use, or more than likely not going to use, so these policies are not all created equal, and it's important to have someone who who knows what they're talking about look at your policies or the quotes before you you buy something. Jack, uh, this has stimulated a question from the audience, which is, uh, if you answer this questionnaire wrong, is there a possibility you could get your cyber uh, insurance denied by the insurance company? Or so. It's it's kind of a, a, a no. I mean, it's kind of a gray area. I mean, usually the way if if you're answering questions and you you think you're answering them correctly, it's it's generally they're they're going to pay out. Now it, it varies dramatically. That's not a cut and dry thing. But um, I, I would say that's why you want to have an IT person go over it with you to make sure that you're you're answering things um, 
to the best of your ability. Now, if there is if there is open manipulation of an application and you you are knowingly lying consistently, then yes, that can definitely happen. But to the average person who's trying their best on these things, that generally does not occur. Okay. And also uh, going back, uh, another question that's been posed is, as we uh, turn up the scrutiny on our employees that are prone to clicking on malicious emails, you know, we we want them, how do we encourage that uh, person to come forward and especially if they've clicked on something and then they're thinking, oh, uh, you know, did I just click on something? Should I ignore that or should I tell somebody? I mean, we've we I think we've heard a couple of stories where in the right environment, they rush to tell IT, hey, I just clicked on something. I don't think I should have done that. So yeah, talk about that, somebody, uh, Jeff or, or or Brian. Yeah, so I answered in the in the chat. I mean, don't be judgmental. Be open to them. The, the, the better you can have an open dialogue with your employees from an IT perspective, even if it's just a monthly or a weekly note out there saying, hey, we're looking secure this week or this month. We did a nice job. You know, whatever uh, and you know I mentioned before not being the shop of no um, the last thing you want them to do is go on to some you know Google or whatever and try and find the answer themselves and, and fix it themselves um, I've had multiple times where uh, obviously someone's clicked on something or I wouldn't have been called in right and uh, they're like oh, I didn't I didn't click on that you find who patient zero is I mean obviously the log files are gonna tell you that I, I didn't click on that I would never do that they're not lying they honestly think there's no way they clicked on that. Because when you show them what they clicked on, they see the absurdity of it in that atmosphere. But in the atmosphere of you know, going through your emails and click, 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 it, it was different. And they did actually click on it. So they're not lying to you when they say, I would have never done that. I, I don't think I did it. And you go, well, actually you did. Um, so again, it, it's a mentality thing. And I think to the extent you get, as I've said before, make them your first line of defense and include them in, in all security aspects, not just cyber, even physical security. I mean, you talk about people tailgating you in and not badging in, right? right. Um, different things like that. You see somebody walking along your fence line, they're going to call security and go, there's some dude loitering along the fence line there. It should be no different in the cyber world as well. Just let them have, give them a place to go. You know, don't be judgmental. And I would reward them for it. Hey, this is great. Thanks for coming. Appreciate it. It's nothing, but thanks for coming you know, and asking us anyway. And, yeah, and, I think and follow up with that and, and talk about if somebody does click on something, what do y'all do? Well, I, I think you, you've got to give, I think, first of all, this, this just hits on the, the, the aspect that cybersecurity is, is a business issue. It's not just an IT issue. Um, and you do have to bring about and develop a culture of security in your organization and let them know that, hey, you know, they're, they're safety in reporting something that could be suspicious. Now you have to think if you're the adversary, you may not want them to report it. And, and if you don't think the adversary is not going to try to convince them, hey, if you tell everybody, then there's consequences or I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. We've seen emails like that uh, sent to individuals, you know, where they want to keep it on the download. Maybe they want to, you know, try to commit some fraud with that individual and they may put that individual on the spot to try to uh, discourage them from, you know, making this, uh, you know, hey, I, you know, we can just keep this between us and we can resolve it. Uh, you know, and, and that may be hard to overcome, but if I'm an adversary, that's, that's the situation I may want. But we have to give them the safety and the ability and the avenue to report, uh, you know, any kind of incident, you know, that they may believe could have been malicious. If they click on a link and something doesn't happen the way it should, then, you know, they need to have hey, a phone number to call. You know, they need to walk down IT and, and talk to somebody. And that's something you have to communicate in your, in your organization regularly. Hey, you know, we're all on the same team. It's us against them. Uh, you know, we, we've got to make sure that we keep our organization secure. We need your help to do that. And, and here's how you can contact uh, the right people if you suspect uh, there's a problem. And, and I think that also goes back to the, the phishing simulations. We can't, you know, we can't be judgmental and, and, you know, and hey, I tricked you type attitude. I do agree with you. There has to be some teeth down the road. Um, you know, if, if we see, the, see continuing failures 
Uh, you know, one way we we've, we've seen key put to it is you just start restricting their access to everything. <laughs> Uh, you know, you, you start, really start closing the envelope on what they can do and what they can do in their computer. Uh, that's one way to do it. So I, I do believe just hey, build a culture, um, you know, provide, you know, provide safety for, for them to report these items, provide an avenue for them to report it, you know, make it a, a business effort, not just a technology effort. All right, we're down to the five minute warning. And so I would like to give each panelist a kind of like final word of wisdom, just go, you know, Jack, then Jeff, then Brian, and then we'll wrap this thing up because we want to respect everybody's time and how valuable it is. So Jack, final words of wisdom from you. Um, I, I would say buy cyber insurance. Um, <laughs> and it, it, they're not all, and I, I keep saying this, but they are not all created equal. Um, you, you may think you have something in place that's adequate and it could easily not be, um and if you don't call and ask questions then you could be talking with an incident response team like jeff when you don't want to be so um that would be my word my advice is is you need to look into cyber insurance if you have not in the past and or if you have in the past you need to look into it again thank you very good jeff final words of wisdom from you yeah if you don't have an ir plan get one and if you do have an IR plan, you've got to practice it. You've got to have those tabletop exercises. I've gone from they were very important to then they kind of went down where they're not as important. And just based on what the managers are doing, very, very important that you practice these things and have these exercises to know who's accountable, who performs well under pressure situations and who's, who doesn't. You may have people assign tasks that they're just not equipped to do under a pressure cooker situation like a, a breach can be. It's not a slide on them. It's just some people perform better under, under stress and, and you know, lack of sleep, things like that than others. So you wanna practice it. You wanna know who these people are. You wanna know what uh, resources can be brought to bear and who brings them to bear for you. Uh, yeah, there, there's a whole lot, you know, up to 20, 25 different individuals who might be part of a tabletop exercise. Uh, so get an IR plan if you don't have one and if you do, practice it. Thank you. Uh, Brian, what about you? So no doubt we, we've covered a lot of, uh, you know, topics during the webinar and, you know, in a lot of these, you know, MFA culture security, we've been on a lot of areas and, you know, there's no doubt there's, there's probably um, some of those during attendance, you know, this has brought about a lot of questions, you know, maybe about uh, their environment that they have at their business, uh, maybe, you know, how they're looking at third parties they do business with, and they're probably wondering where to start, you know, how, how, how do I know where I stand? And, and so always, you know, talk to clients. The first thing you can always look at it is get an assessment, you know, to see where you're at, see what your posture is, uh, get in touch with the IT provider, get in touch with me. There, there's plenty of people out there that can do these assessments um, and, you know, try to find out, you know, what your baseline looks like because, you know, these threats are going to keep coming and they're going to keep evolving. And, uh, you know, and just sitting there and not knowing where your company stands is, is not going to, deem you well in the future you're going to be talking to jack or be talking to jeff later on uh you know that so i encourage you to be proactive find out what your baseline is uh many times you know these assessments are not painful uh they're very very valuable they at least give you a roadmap and a place to start uh, preparing your company to defend it uh, against these adversaries Thank you for joining us and a very huge thanks to Brian, Jeff, and Jack for taking the time to speak with us today. As a reminder, CPE certificates will be issued two to three weeks following today's webinar. Thank you and have a wonderful day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Keith. Thanks, everybody.